Just before the video begins, please subscribe and like the videos to help the channel grow. Thanks for watching. When the Beatles actually broke up, mm -hmm. did you think at that point that that was pretty much the end of your career? I mean, did you know, because you put out a couple of albums within that year when you broke up. Me personally, I sat in the garden saying, oh, what will I do now? Hmm. Suddenly, like, that was over, and it was like, hmm. In 1969, the impending breakup of the Beatles left Ringo directionless. He'd sat in his garden and wondered what he was going to do with his life. On the encouragement of his bandmates, Ringo began work on his first solo album, Sentimental Journey. George Martin agreed to produce the album and Ringo crooned his way through each track, mainly covers, until the album was complete. The album was released in March of 1970. The impact was diluted when Paul released his album, McCartney, just a month later. With the demise of the Beatles, Paul McCartney was going through a severe depression. His wife Linda later stated he was close to a nervous breakdown. He was at the time living in a remote farmhouse called High Park in Kintyre, Scotland. It came with a dilapidated farmhouse and 200 acres of land. He'd purchased High Park back in 1966 on the encouragement of his then girlfriend Jane Asher. It was a place Paul could go to when he didn't want to be bothered. He'd allowed his neighbour's sheep to graze the land on the condition they watch over the house while he was away. It was freezing cold at the farmhouse and renovations began in 1969. At the time, rumours were circulating that Paul had died in a car crash and Life magazine travelled to Scotland in order to investigate. When they knocked on Paul's door, he flew into a rage. He threw a bucket of water over them before taking a swing at their photographer. Paul around this time was drinking heavily. He later said, I wouldn't get up in the morning, and when I did get up, I wouldn't shave or bother with anything, and I'd reach for the whiskey. His wife Linda was living at the farm too, and through encouragement and support, helped to pull Paul out of the spiral he was in. She told him he could still make music without the Beatles, and his career as a songwriter was not over. Paul left High Park and headed for London, where the next stage of his life would begin. In April of 1970, Paul McCartney's first solo album made its debut. It was simply titled McCartney and was almost entirely recorded in secrecy at his home in St. John's Wood. The entire album had been written and recorded solely by him. He played every instrument on the tracks, overdubbing on a four track tape recorder. The track summed up Paul's feelings at the time. Maybe I'm Amazed was a tribute to the woman who stuck by Paul at his lowest point. He wrote a song called Every Night, which referenced his relationship with alcohol during this period. The lyrics read, Every night I just want to go out, get out of my head. The bulk of the album was worked on in Paul's kitchen with other parts divided between EMI and Morgan Studios in West London. The album did very well commercially, reaching number one in the US and number two in the UK. Critically, it was ripped apart. One reviewer stated that the album, in essence, was one man alone in a small recording studio, fiddling around with half-written songs and a load of instruments. In a Rolling Stone magazine interview, John Lennon called the album rubbish. Not long after, Ringo's second solo album, Bukus of Blues, was released. Being a big fan of the genre, the album was country and western inspired. It did so poorly in the UK it failed to even chart. In the US it fared better, peaking at 35 in the charts. In a Rolling Stone magazine, Lennon stated it was a good record, but added, I didn't feel as embarrassed as I did about Ringo's first record. 
John and Yoko at this time were working together as the Plastic Ono Band. Instant Karma had been recorded with George Harrison playing guitar and Phil Spector producing. While recording the tracks for Let It Be, a film crew had documented the band and the movie was to have its premiere. Paul and George had insisted John and Yoko's screen time be cut short. They also wanted the now legendary argument between the pair taken out. Harrison especially hated the movie, and while he was alive, he would do everything in his power to block any attempts on reissuing the film on DVD. George Harrison's solo album had been on his mind since 1968. His trip to India and devotion to meditation had regenerated his love for songwriting. His demo tapes of the song All Things Must Pass received little interest from either Lennon or McCartney. But by the time Abbey Road was released, his songs had progressed to anything the pair could write. With the confirmation of the Beatles' demise, George had begun work on All Things Must Pass. Phil Spector was hired to produce the album. George later mentioned, I needed a producer and he needed a job. Spector was a heavy drinker and was intoxicated for the recording. Harrison later said, Spectre needed 18 cherry brandies before he could start work. At one point during the session, Spectre tripped over and broke his arm. The first song to be recorded was Wow Wow. It was a jab at McCartney, first penned after their argument during the Get Back sessions. The lyrics read, I don't need your wow wow. When George listened back to the song, he didn't like the sound Phil Spectre had created. He was shocked at the amount of echo used, but over time it grew on him. George's mother had been suffering the effects of cancer, and he delayed sessions to drive to Liverpool and see her for the last time. By the end, Harrison had so many songs the album would be released as a triple album. He charged a record-breaking prize for the album, and it was met with both commercial and critical acclaim. John Lennon Plastic Ono Band was released just a few weeks later. It was produced by John Lennon, Yoko Ono and Phil Spector. Lennon had begun Primal Therapy, a psychotherapy that focused on childhood trauma. This features heavily on the album with two songs about the abandonment of his mother. Before the recording, John's estranged father had contacted him for a reconciliation, but when they met at John's home, he flew into a rage and threatened to kill him. Recording began in Abbey Road where Ringo laid down some drum tracks for the album. During recording, John would burst out crying and start screaming halfway through a track. This deeply disturbed Ringo as he'd never seen John behave like this before. Spectre was absent for much of the recording, therefore John and Yoko did the bulk of production. When all was finished, John considered it his best work and nicknamed the album Sergeant Lennon. The album received mixed to positive reviews at the time, but today is looked back on as his best solo album. With the heavy criticism Paul had received from McCartney, he hired the best studio musicians he could find and went to Abbey Road Studios to record his second solo album. Paul and John had begun arguing between interviews and Paul's frustrations began appearing in his lyrics. On the song Too Many People, Paul referenced John dissolving the group. The lyrics read, That was your first mistake, you took your lucky break and broke it in two. His feelings of betrayal were voiced on the song Three Legs with the lyrics, When I thought you was my friend, well you let me down, put my heart around the bend. On this track, he also seemed to be alluding to the fact that without Paul, the Beatles cannot function with the lyrics. My dog, he got three legs, but he can't run. When the album was complete, Paul felt he would silence the criticism he'd received from McCartney. But unfortunately, in the eyes of critics, Ram fared no better. One critic wrote, How do you tell an ex-Beatle that he's wrote a lousy album? John's response came in his second solo album, Imagine. While in New York, John and George had jammed together 
after which George was asked to play on Imagine. As with the formula of the previous album, Lennon, Ono and Phil Spector would all produce the album. The documentary titled Gimme Some Truth was being filmed at the time and caught a lot of the recording sessions. How Do You Sleep attacked McCartney's songwriting ability and his relevance in music. It's been said Alan Klein and Yoko contributed ideas for the lyrics. Ringo visited the studio and was upset upon hearing the song. While John was playing it, Ringo said, that's enough John. The album package contained a picture of John wrestling a pig, a parody of Paul's album cover. Three months after, in December 1971, Paul released his third studio album and first album with his new group Wings. Wildlife took just over a week to complete, with the majority of songs requiring just one take. In the album, Paul responded to John's song, How Do You Sleep, with Dear Friend. It was an attempt to bury the hatchet and possibly an attempt at reconciliation. He later stated, I just felt sad about the breakup in our friendship and this song kind of came flowing out. Dear friend, what's the time? Is this really the borderline? Are we splitting up? Is this you go your way, I'll go mine? The album was met with lukewarm reviews. It was seen as a below par effort. Right at the time, Paul needed a little respect. Phil Spector, who Paul had fallen out with over the production of Let It Be, spoke to John about wildlife. He asked, Have you heard Paul's new album? It's really bad. It's awful. Sometime in New York City was John's third solo album, a mix of both studio and live recordings. Again, it was produced by Lennon, Ono and Spector. By this time, John and Yoko had moved to New York and were deeply involved in politics. His political messages can be heard throughout, especially in songs like Luck of the Irish, Sunday Bloody Sunday and Attic Estate. The album was packaged as a newspaper and to Lennon's shock flopped. Critics hailed the album Artistic Suicide. In May 1973, Paul's next album with Wings, Red Rose Speedway, was released. Paul had problems with producer Glyn Johns during recording. Johns didn't see Wings as a serious band, and when Paul told him to treat him like a bass player, not Paul McCartney, that's exactly what he did. John stated, The minute I started talking to him like the bass player, it was like, who the hell do you think you're talking to? Johns also stated, They're not a band in my opinion. It's Paul McCartney and a bunch of guys. During the sessions, Wings smoked dope and jammed in the studio. Johns didn't even roll the tape. Instead, he sat in the control room reading a newspaper. When the band confronted him, saying, We're not happy with you as a producer. You're not interested in what we're doing. He responded, When you do something interesting, I'm there. Johns left the project and later described the album as a load of rubbish. Surprisingly, the album went to number one in the US and number five in the UK. Although commercially successful, critically the album was met with negative reviews. It was seen as unimpressive, not to the standard expected of Paul McCartney. Just a few weeks later, George's next album, Living in the Material World, was released. George at this point was hailed as a hero for his charitable work on the concert for Bangladesh. The songs on the albums documented George's search for inner peace. Some cited his failing marriage was the catalyst. Recording took place mainly in George's home studio. Phil Spector was originally intended to produce, but Spector's unpredictable behaviour, coupled with his alcoholism, meant he had little involvement. The album was eagerly awaited by fans and critics. The commercial success was phenomenal. It went gold two days after release. It was met with mainly positive reviews, though some objected to the religious overtones. Three months later, in October of 1973, Mind Games was released. 
This time, John produced the album by himself without Spectre or Ono. John and Yoko were having marital problems during this period. He was now distancing himself from the political messages that filled his previous work. The album consisted of half somber songs, love songs to Yoko, and optimistic, upbeat, rockabilly style tracks. The reception was lukewarm. Lennon later said of the album, The Mind Game single is fine, but there's just no energy to sustain through the album and there's no clarity of vision. That cover says more to me than the record. Following the success of the single It Don't Come Easy, which was co-written by George Harrison, Ringo decided to make his first rock album. Twelve well-known musicians were on board to help Ringo, as well as the other three Beatles. Ringo was released and became so far his most critical and commercial success. Paul at this time wanted to record his next Wings album in an exotic location, so he and Linda flew over to Lagos in Nigeria. The trip was cursed before it even began. Disagreements had seen them lose two members of Wings, and to add to the stress, when they arrived in Lagos, it was not the tropical paradise they'd envisioned. The lodgings they stayed in were filled with spiders, lizards and other insects. It was uncomfortably hot, and the recording studio was a shed with no acoustics. Cream drummer Ginger Baker was living in Africa at this time, and Paul booked his studio to use. Paul only used Ginger's studio for one day, and Ginger believed he'd only used him for a visa and different accommodation. Ginger felt betrayed Paul had booked to use his studio, but recorded the album at EMI instead. Fela Kuti, an African musician and friend of Ginger Baker, turned up at EMI and stopped the recording session. He had part ownership of Ginger's studio and was angry Paul was using EMI instead. Baker had to drive to EMI and smooth things over. Fela and his army would stop the sessions. And I had to go down to EMI studios and talk to Fela. McCartney would never have made that record if it wasn't for me. The locals were hostile towards Paul and he was mugged one night out with Linda. He lost any valuable items he had on him, which included a bag of demo tapes for Band on the Run. To others around, Paul stayed positive about the project. He was a person who preferred to grieve in private. During the recording, Paul began gasping for air, unable to breathe. Linda was convinced he was having a heart attack and they walked outside. The blazing heat made the situation worse and he went completely white and fainted. A doctor was called and the official diagnosis turned out to be bronchial spasm brought on by too much smoking. With Band on the Run, Paul finally achieved the critical acclaim that had eluded him. Rolling Stone magazine commented, With the possible exception of John Lennon's Plastic Ono Band, the finest record yet released by any of the four musicians who were once called the Beatles. By July 1974, John Lennon and Yoko Ono were going through a separation which Lennon later called his Lost Weekend. He was drinking heavily at this time and in a relationship with his personal assistant, May Peng. A friend said of John's drinking, if he had one glass of wine, I'd have to cancel plans for the next three days. The tracks on the album, Walls and Bridges, comprised of messages to Yoko, newfound freedom and self-pity. John always described his songs as personal diaries. May Pang later said of John's songwriting, he would take phrases he heard and write them down. He always kept a pen and pad by the bed. The album was an enjoyable experience for John, and though reviews were mixed, it was the best album he'd done in years. All four Beatles had featured on Ringo, the most critically acclaimed solo venture for Richard Starkey but only John Lennon would feature in his next album, Goodnight Vienna. <laughs> 
Lennon wrote the title track before he recorded Walls and Bridges. Elton John, along with other musicians, wrote songs that featured on the album, and a few covers were thrown in. The reviews were generally favourable, and the album reached number 30 in the UK. A month later, George Harrison's eagerly anticipated follow-up to Living in the Material World was released. Dark Horse was recorded during one of the most turbulent times in George's life. His marriage had ended, and his use of mind-altering substances and alcohol were at an all-time high. He was physically run down, having just come off a tour with Ravi Shankar. In this tour, his voice was depleted to the point it was barely a whisper. With the minor criticisms of living in the material world still in George's head, he lowered the religious tone for Dark Horse. The sense of spiritual hope that had came with his two previous albums was gone. One track title summed up George's feelings perfectly. It was titled, I Don't Care Anymore. The album was a flop and it failed to even chart in the UK. This left George in a deep depression. He isolated himself in his gigantic mansion and used alcohol to numb his emotional pain. The title Dark Horse, he later said, was a reference to himself in the Beatles, him being the overlooked member unlikely to succeed. Meanwhile, Lennon too had turned to alcohol. A year previous, he had recorded a rock and roll album with Phil Spector. I won't go into this too much as it's detailed in my other documentary, John Lennon Working Class Hero, but here's a summary. John gave Phil Spector complete control and envisioned himself as one of the groups Phil worked with in the earlier years. Phil went insane with power, John drank more, Phil drank more, the musicians hired for the album drank more, Spectre held the finished masters hostage and eventually they were released in 1975. The album was met with mixed reviews and John later said it was jinxed. He wouldn't release another album until five years later and this would be his last. With Paul riding high from the success of Band on the Run, fans eagerly awaited his follow-up album, Venus and Mars. Paul had lost two members of Wings and a lead guitarist and drummer were added to the lineup. Linda was also part of the band and the new guitarist reduced her to tears with criticisms of her musical ability. Paul, as it happened, agreed with him. Further arguments saw the drummer being replaced to finish the album. According to May Pang, Lennon had planned to visit the sessions and begin writing with Paul again. These plans were aborted when John reconciled with Yoko. Venus and Mars reached number one in both the UK and the US. Reviews were mainly positive and Paul's success continued. Meanwhile, George was still troubled from the panning Dark Horse had received. In his darkest moments, he'd began to doubt his religious beliefs. George was very cautious when he re-entered the studio for Extra Texture, Read All About It. Songwriting wasn't a problem. Even at his darkest period, he continued writing music. While recording the songs, George feared the criticisms of his songwriting abilities were true. The album steered away from religion as with his previous effort and the album was met with mixed to negative reviews. It was commercially successful and he appeared on the cover of Melody Maker magazine with the title George Bounces Back. 1975 ended with Paul McCartney turning up to the Dakota building. It was late in December and he and Linda showed up at John's front door where they began singing We Wish You a Merry Christmas. When John heard the commotion outside, at first he thought it was carol singers. A photographer let them in and the two Beatles hugged and talked long into the night. By early 1976, the members of Wings were facing criticism for being merely session musicians for Paul McCartney. Paul himself always had his critics. One stated, he just writes silly love songs. 
Paul wrote the track's silly love songs in response. The message was clear. He liked writing love songs and he didn't care if anyone else didn't. A heavy smoker all his life, Paul's dad had recently died at the age of 73. Paul didn't attend the funeral through fear of a media circus, which no doubt there would have been. Wings at the Speed of Sound was recorded at Abbey Road Studios. The tracks on the album were not only sung by Paul, but every member of Wings, and though commercially successful, reviews were negative. George's health by this point had deteriorated to the point he needed to stop drinking, otherwise he would be facing death. A doctor diagnosed him with hepatitis and he soon sobered up, later stating, I needed the hepatitis to quit drinking. He was now nearing his mid-thirties and decided to name his next album 33 and a third. Now sober, the sessions for the album were light-hearted. George had stopped taking his music so seriously at this point and he just wanted to have fun in the studio. 33 and a third was a massive success. It outsold both Dark Horse and Extra Texture in America. Critics praised the album and George was better musically, physically and emotionally than he had been in years. As well as his music career, Ringo regularly landed acting roles as well as directing and producing. For tax reasons, he'd left the UK. Ringo's Rotogre Review was released in early 1967. With the album, he stuck to his previous formula. Friends would come over, write songs for the album, and a few covers would feature. The other three Beatles made contributions, but this was not enough to save it. The album flopped massively, failing to chart in the UK, dropping off the charts quickly in the US. If this album was bad, Ringo's next album, Ringo the Fourth, was catastrophic. He decided to scrap the previous formula and decided to write several of the songs himself with a fellow songwriter. The result was a disco album that was seen as a joke by fans and critics. Meanwhile, Paul McCartney had lost his drummer and his lead guitarist again. Wings were back down to three members. They began recording London Town in Abbey Road Studios, but tired of the cold English weather, so they finished the album on a yacht in the Caribbean. During the sessions, one of the band suffered sunstroke and another broke his leg. Parties were held on the boat while the boat was docked at Watermelon Bay and the residents complained about the noise. Mull of Kintyre turned out to be Paul's biggest hit. It hit number one in the UK charts and stayed there for nine weeks. The music video gave the impression Paul was outside his Scotland home. It was actually a house a few miles up next to a beach. The album didn't fare so well. It did okay commercially, but not as well as the previous albums. Critically, it was ripped apart. Mull of Kintar didn't do so well in the US, and Paul felt Capitol Records didn't give London Town enough promotion. After the disastrous Ringo the Fourth, Richard Starkey dropped the disco genre and reverted back to his previous formula. Bad Boy was released and as predicted, sales were poor. After this, his record label in Germany dropped him. Before Ringo could complete his next album, his US record label dropped him too. George by 1979 had begun writing his autobiography, I, Me, Mine. He printed only 2,000 copies, signed each one, and charged £148 each. That's the equivalent to £647 today. Eventually, a mainstream publisher picked it up and distributed more copies. Lennon hated it. For the full story on this, check out my documentary, George Harrison, Here, There and Everywhere. Around this time, George became interested in Formula One racing. A year previous, his father had died and his son had been born. While writing his next self-titled album, George listened to All Things Must Pass for inspiration. 
The album sold well considering George's lack of promotion. His interests at this point had switched from music to film. When asked why he made the album, George stated, it was to please his friends in the Formula One community. After the release of London Town, Paul McCartney replaced his lead guitarist and drummer again. When the new lineup sat down to play Scrabble, the game was cut short because guitarist Denny Lane couldn't spell. After that, Wings began work on their next album, Back to the Egg. Keith Moon agreed to play drums for some tracks on the album, but he died of a drug overdose shortly afterwards. The studio sessions went on so long, EMI kicked Paul out of the studio as other artists needed to record. Compared to Wings' previous albums, sales were poor. It was slated by critics, one calling it the sorriest grab bag of dreck in recent history. The problem was, everyone Paul was working with was starstruck. No one would dare criticise his music while recording, and the truth was never told. In June 1980, John Lennon and five others boarded his boat, the Megan J, and sailed to Bermuda. On the journey, they encountered a storm, and one by one, each member of the ship's crew became too sick to pilot the ship. Lennon was the only one aboard who was not overcome with fatigue and there was no other option but for him to take the wheel. John was notorious for not even being able to drive a car without crashing it, and he had serious self-doubts. Alone, he steered the ship for six hours. When the ordeal was over, John was filled with confidence and a new appreciation for life. It inspired him to begin writing songs again, and thus Double Fantasy began. The sessions began in secret, and enough songs were recorded for two albums. Milk and Honey would be released four years after Lennon's death. Although featured on Milk and Honey, Nobody Told Me was originally intended to feature on Ringo's next LP. As they couldn't decide on the photo, the single sleeve was used as the front cover. The album was released a few weeks before Lennon's death. It peaked at number 8 on the UK charts, but shot straight to number 1 following his murder. The tracks on Double Fantasy were filled with peace, harmony, acceptance of middle age, and an optimism for old age, which of course, Lennon would not make. <laughs> 